if you've uh, done any reading or work in counseling, that type of uh, psychology stuff, you know that one of the uh, things they do is to have case studies. We'll be looking at case studies tonight, <clears throat> not because necessarily you're having the same situation, but uh, they are instructive as we go back and analyze and break them up. So let's ask God to instruct us in this art of removing bitterness tonight. <coughs> God tells us that holding bitterness is something that will defile many, and so uh, by all means, uh, removing bitterness is a goal that we must have because we need it. Uh, it's not that we're only affecting others. So identifying the problem. Uh, take a normal situation at a home and people end up yelling and screaming and, and uh, cursing sometimes and throwing things. It's uh, just a bitterness that needs to stop. But what's the problem? I say, well, that's easy. It's him. It's her. But uh, very often we're playing a part in that. So here's a suggestion to help you effectively identify the basic offense in a situation. Number one, list the people with whom you have regular contact. That may be a lot, maybe a few. Circle the ones with whom you have conflicts. And uh, so you are identifying the ones that you have conflicts with. And then estimate how often you have conflicts with each. Is it once a week, once a day? Six times a day? When, are, when do you have those conflicts? And then, number four, describe in detail the most recent conflict. And this is to the best of your memory, and of course, uh, being the author, uh, you're going to play the hero, and they're going to play the villain, So, but you recognize that as you write it out. So let me give you uh, some actual case histories of some teens that we're working on this material. And um, we have several stories here. First of all, uh, a young lady says she comes home. Friday, I came home for lunch from school, and both of my brothers were there. When I came in the door, the younger brother said, what are you doing here? I said, I came home for lunch. He said, you can go back to school where you belong. Since they were there before me, they should have had my lunch ready. I said, why didn't you fix me anything? He said, we didn't feel like it. When I asked why they were acting that way, he said, it's none of your business. Here's the conflict. We had a few wrong words, and I went back to school without any lunch. I am very disappointed in my brother. <laughs> and so conflict and uh, people parting their ways upset with one another. A second story. I was washing the floor when my little sister came in from playing. I asked her to get upstairs and help my other sister clean her room. She looked at me as if to say, just who do you think you are? She bluntly said, no. Mom was on the phone, so I took matters into my own hands and began to help her walk upstairs. I ended up dragging her by her arms. I didn't hurt her, but to cause trouble, she began to scream and cry as if I were trying to kill her bitterness, conflict. Young man says, I was sitting in front of the TV, naturally. My dad came in and told me, go do something besides watching TV. So I went over, got one of my friends. We were playing in the garage and we were bouncing the basketball against the back door. <laughs> of course, that would be a great thing to do. My dad came out swearing at us like he always does. And I said, well, you don't have to swear about it. And he said, I'll swear if I want to. And I told him, not around me, swear some other place. Well, that set off the fuse. He grabbed a stick from the garage and came at me swinging. I told my friend to scatter. He ran one way, I ran the other. We went over to his house, and he told his mother what happened, and she said, I couldn't come over anymore. At this rate, I'm going to lose all my friends. When I came home, my dad said, if you don't stop causing trouble, I'm going to stick you in a home. He always threatens to stick me in a home. Another case. Dad, Mom, and I were at the breakfast table, 
another young lady, when we started discussing my future occupation, when my wife and I took our 10-year-old grandson, Jude, out sitting, uh, he's, a, he's a steak eater, we found out, and uh, so we took him to the beef house over there by Illinois, and uh, so he was, uh, we were waiting for the food, so I said, when, when we bring the grandkids out on this day, I like to ask them, because now you're 10, you're two digits old, you know, that won't change until you turn 100, but I said, you've already lived 10 years, one decade, he was talking about how I used to think a decade was like a really long time, and now he, here he is a decade old. And I said, in the next decade, you'll be 20 years old. Just this amount of time again, you'll be 20 years old. And in college, he says, I might be married, raising kids. I, said, well, I suppose that's possible. And um, so I said, what, do you see yourself doing something then? I think most impressive of all the grandkids we've ever asked this, we had one that said, huh, I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I choose my TV shows and complain about the food. That's about all I do. Uh, but um, he said, uh, well, by that time, I want to be able to provide for my family and uh, have a job that means something to me. And, <laughs> wow. <laughs> he thought this thing through. Well, they were sitting uh, at the breakfast table, started discussing my future occupation. Somehow, I said the wrong thing. I said that my life as a married woman would have little outside activity, etc. I gave my mom's life as an example. I didn't mean for it to cause friction, but it sure did. She told me I was ungrateful, unwilling to help around the house, etc. I said many things I shouldn't have. It's so hard. I love her very much, but we always have a tense feeling between us. So I don't know what your background is, was, but uh, some of this might sound familiar. But let me ask you to approach this tonight on the basis of here are some things that these kids act actually happened to them. They reported this back to their youth pastor. And what if you were the youth pastor? What if you were the one giving them the counsel? What would you do? Well, <clears throat> here's what we did, and we'll take these um, ideas and then go back and look at these case studies. Step one, list one person's faults. The first step in solving conflicts with a particular member of your family is to list all the wrongs and offenses he has committed against you. This is easy because we're very sensitive to how we've been offended. But let me expand your list. Examples of offenses. Promising to do something for me and failing to keep the promise. Punishing me for things I didn't do. I heard about the kid who went to this teacher and said, you wouldn't punish me for something I didn't do. He says, oh, of course not. He says, okay, I didn't do my homework. <laughs> Being too strict in punishing me for things I did do. Giving more attention and love to the other members of the family. Refusing to understand why I do certain things. They just refuse to understand that. Setting a poor example for me. Telling me not to do things I see them doing. Taking out their frustrations on me. Expecting too much work at home from me. And not being there when I need them. And so with these ideas, <clears throat> you begin to write down uh, fairly easily the things that you see as their faults. Then step two, list your faults. Well, it's relatively easy to remember the faults of others, but when it comes to listing our own faults, we may discover a lapse of memory. I don't think I did anything wrong. To compensate for this difficulty, I suggest the following questions. Have you shown perhaps a poor attitude? It's relatively, uh, if your parents were to, if the, your parents were to rate your attitude around the house, would they say it was above average, average, or below average? You have a bad attitude. How about would they see you as ungrateful? 
<clears throat> when is the last time you thanked your parents for the ordinary things they do for you, such as providing meals, working to maintain your home and car, and other benefits? How about stubbornness? Would they recognize stubbornness in you? What is your immediate response when asked to do something around the house? Multiple choice. I do it immediately. I ask why it needs to be done. I say, I'll do it later. I say, I can't do it. I ask why someone else can't do it. How about untruthfulness? Have you done anything to cause your parents to lose confidence in you? For instance, have you told them only part of the truth so they would agree with you? Where did you go? I went to Joe's house. And then we together went and did that, 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 that. But I'm not telling you that. Then they find out. Have you made decisions on your own that your parents should have made with you? How about bitterness? Are you showing bitterness? Have you been harboring resentments and bitterness for things your parents have done toward you or your brothers and sisters? Is that building up? Is that something that you're holding against them? <clears throat> then, possibly, laziness? How neatly have you kept your room? How often have you spent time watching TV when you knew you should be doing other things? Uh, watching TV, maybe playing video games, whatever it is. All right. Once you've identified what they might see as your faults, then step three, purpose to ask forgiveness. This is back to our main study of clearing your conscience. And it actually, we're fitting it in now to a larger package of things. We're saying clear your conscience so that you can help them. So purpose to ask forgiveness. This is by far the most difficult step because you have to say I was wrong. God has shown me I was wrong. And then you have to actually ask if they will forgive you and just stop talking and wait for them to answer. By far the most difficult step must be done in an attitude of complete sincerity, genuine repentance, you have to really ask for forgiveness. And then identify the basic offense. Uh, it's important to distinguish between immediate offenses and basic offenses. They are not always the same. It does little good to ask forgiveness for a small offense when in reality that offense is only a fraction of a much greater offense. In the conflicts described earlier, our case studies, the following statements reveal previous offenses being brought into the present conflict. You're not dealing with people every day brand new. You're talking to people that have a picture of you and the way you are. Home for lunch. The brother said, you can just go back to school where you belong. Well, the immediate offense was described as a few wrong words, but this reveals the basic offense as a wrong attitude toward the brothers, a failure to, by love, serve one another. Um, how would that loving attitude have responded? The washing the floor girl. Little sister projected, who do you think you are to give me orders? <coughs> the immediate offense was taking matters into my own hands. Mom was on the phone. That was the immediate offense, but the basic offense was harboring bitterness against the sister who was playing while she had to work. How dare you play when I have to work? That's the basic offense. Then the uh, stick you in a home story. Dad said, if you don't stop causing trouble, I'm going to stick you in a home. The immediate offense 
was banging the basketball against the back door. Now, if he came to him and said, it was wrong for me to bang the basketball against the back door, will you forgive me? Probably not, because that's just one in a whole series of things. The basic offense was an attitude of ungratefulness, stubbornness, and laziness. And then the breakfast table story. The mom said, you're ungrateful, unwilling to help around the house. Well, that's the revelation. The immediate offense was saying many things they shouldn't have. The basic offense was an attitude of ungratefulness and laziness in duties at home. All right. <clears throat> so ask forgiveness for the basic offense. <clears throat> you remember, we've talked about this, that there are many ways to ask forgiveness that will not work effectively. <clears throat> you can go through it, but it's not going to be effective. I was wrong, but you were too. If I was wrong, please forgive me. Or just, I'm sorry. The only genuine statement that reflects true sincerity and humility is, God has convicted me about how wrong I was in my basic offense. I know I have wronged you in this. I have come to ask, will you forgive me? Ask forgiveness for the basic offense. And step four, fully forgive their offenses. This is where uh, you have to deal with this. I'm uh, talking to a student who is, could hardly sleep uh, Tuesday night, and he was in my class on Wednesday morning, going over and over, Dr. Halcombe leaving the school, and uh, feeling offended by it and didn't know how to let it go. Well, in the end of it, this is just obedience. The uh, apostle tells his people, forgiving one another as Jesus forgave you. You remember the story of the slave that owed in, in modern money, millions of dollars. I must have been involved in investing or something. And so he was going to be sold, and his wife and children sold off. And uh, he begged down, I'll pay you back every cent. I'll pay you back. Please, please, please. And so he just had compassion on him, and he forgave him the whole debt. Well, then he decides he's going to be very careful with his money. So he goes out and he finds a guy that owes him $1.50. And he badgers him, and he says, I don't have it. I don't have it. He sends him to prison, debtor's prison, because <laughs> he can't pay him the dollar fifty. And he, the other servants are saying, I can't believe the guy did that. And so they go to the master and say, he's doing this. I don't think that's right. And now compassion turns to anger, and the master says to him, how is it I could forgive you all that debt and you couldn't forgive that little debt. So I'm sending you off. I'm banishing you, and you're gone. Don't be that person. Recognize how you offended Christ and how he forgave you. Now fully forgive the people who actually offended you, who actually did wrong things. So it is not only logical but also essential to forgive fully those from whom we purpose to ask forgiveness. You can't do the asking of forgiveness if you're harboring bitterness. It just won't happen. You must complete this step with sincerity, with no reservations. I'm sorry, except for the part where I got you back. Now that you have identified and dealt with the basic personal offenses, you can expect a relationship between your offenses and the ones offended. That's a cryptic statement. Uh, what it's saying is this, that once you <clears throat> recognize how they offended you, then you go to yourself and see how you have offended them. You're ready to ask forgiveness for that. You see that those things are connected, <clears throat> that the people around you often reflect what you have been doing. Uh, re 
reflection like a mirror. You are seeing you in them. Now that you've identified and dealt with the personal offenses, you can expect a relationship between your offenses and those of the ones offended. So in the conflicts described earlier, notice the relationship between the offended person and his offense. So let's go back to home for lunch. The brothers were reflecting poor attitudes of their sister back to her. The basic offense to forgive is the brother's attitude of bitterness and laziness. She didn't quietly make her own lunch. It was, why, why haven't you made mine? I'm disappointed in them, you see. The washing the floor story. The little sister's belligerence resulted from the older sister assuming responsibility that was not hers. The basic offense to forgive is the little sister producing irritations and your wrong response. The stick you in a home story. The father's anger stemmed from the son's misuse of his time. The basic offense to forgive is the father's poor example of Christian maturity, evidenced by swearing and giving a vent to a bad temper. The breakfast table scene. The mother's tense feeling resulted from the ungratefulness and laziness of the daughter. The basic offense to forgive is her mother's resentment against her daughter. So you see it reflected. <clears throat> this is why uh, undoing this situation is one that uh, you see you have been poisoning the waters in which you are swimming. You have been defiling the home in which you live. Um, your bad attitude becomes reflected in the people around you. Now, if you can help people, help yourself in understanding this, but help others to see this. Uh, so easy to say, it's not me, it's them. But, and while it is them, it's also you. So help them to see this and see that they, there's actually an undoing of all this. All right, last thing, done early. I had five pages of words here, but uh, they're just mostly case study. We determined to do this, but de be determined to follow through. Encourage people to begin this process, but just don't give it up, and they will give it up because it demands much from them. Be prepared for the long term. <laughs> Matthew 18, 21, 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my uh, brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Sometimes this means you uh, find other things that they've offended, not just the same sin. But your relationship with God depends on your willingness to forgive others. You see what I'm saying? Your personal relationship with God is affected if you're not willing to forgive others. Matthew 6, 14, 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What does it mean? I, I lose my salvation? No, it means <clears throat> that the consequences of your sin will come upon you. What we ask is God forgive our sins so we don't have to bear those consequences. And God says, no, you get the consequences. But why? Because you wouldn't forgive others. But I thought if I just ask, yeah. 
but you don't get forgiveness. The consequences are not canceled out if you're not willing to ask for forgiveness and to forgive. So, case studies, you can supply your own, <clears throat> get to the place where you see this in others, you begin to be the, the wise person who can dissect the problem. Uh, as I was reading to you the case studies, <clears throat> sound like a big mess, sound like a, you, you came in on an ongoing problem, you're right. So uh, dissecting it, analyzing it, and urging people to do the right thing be a great opportunity for you to share the wisdom of God with others. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, <coughs> thank you for the opportunity to look into these lives of young people who were willing to have their, their case studies given and to share them with others, others that they would never see or hear from, and are willing because these problems were solved their homes became better places to live. The people involved were quieter, calmer, and more loving because they were actually willing to do this and actually accomplish it. So we pray, Father, that you might bring this blessing upon our own homes and as we think of uh, families, perhaps even extended families, where the relationships are just wrong. We just need to start doing this this entire process with them. But we can also then counsel others to say there is hope. There is an answer to this. But the main answer is giving up on pride of self, being willing to ask forgiveness and to forgive. We ask, Father, because this deals with each one of us, we ask that you might apply this to our hearts, even as we were singing that we would learn these things as we give our lives to thee. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>